We're inside the African American Firefighter Museum, which is home of Old Fire Station Number 30, and we're here on the apparatus floor. The only original thing about this fire station, which was built in 1913, are the four exterior walls, the three fire poles, and the apparatus floor. On the wall, we have a picture that made the uh, Los Angeles Times in 2002. It tells the story of the first African American firefighter, which was Sam Haskins here in Los Angeles. Sam Haskins was born a slave in 1840, and he came to Los Angeles in the 1880s. In 1888, he joined the fire department. In 1892, he was uh, appointed to be a call man. And unfortunately, his life tragically ended in 1895 when he was killed responding to a fire. And so two years later, George Bright joined the fire department in 1897, and he is now known as our second black firefighter, and Sam Haskins is now known as our first African-American firefighter here in Los Angeles. As we come up the stairs, we have a few pictures on the wall here, and a couple of uh, artifacts. One of them is one of my favorite, the badge. The badge is written by engineer Ron Price, who is an African-American firefighter. And it's basically a testament to what firefighters have to go through, and it's a beautiful piece. So those that come to the museum, we hope they can take the time to read this and see what Ron has put down from his thoughts. This picture right here is of our old Stentorians, the original founders of, this, of the organization. They're pictured here with Fire Chief William Bamatri and also the members of the Fire Commission. This picture was taken about a year ago when the Fire Commission hosted one of their meetings here. Please visit our website at www.aaffmuseum.org or call us at 213-744-1730. Thank you. On behalf of the uh, executive staff of the African American Fire Museum, I'd like to present this picture to you. And uh, it's for you and your men. All right. Thank you. I was so ashamed of in 1940. Now I'm so cotton picking proud of it, I donate 10 hours every week to come and tell the story and share the glory. Hey everybody, this is Blaze from Unified Fathers for Life, and we have the pleasure today of honoring Mr. Arnett Hartsfield, and he's brought a few friends from the, the prestigious history of the African-American fighter fire and we are also let me just say we're at uh, 1401 South Central and what is this building to you sir? It's the building I reported to 67 years ago. Now I had a calculator you know this is modern technology and I checked out how long ago it was 67 years 22,264 days ago <laughs> that this gentleman walked through this door. So uh, I'm going to read just a little bit, then I'm going to give the microphone to the storytelling of the rookie, and he can interact with his friends the way he wants. Uh, we'd like to thank everyone for being here, especially firemen. This is very important to us, and we appreciate your time. Um, while at UCLA, and he was a classmate of long life for lifetime friend Tom Bradley, uh, they fought for Mr. Hartsfield to begin the UCLA ROTC back in 1940. They succeeded, so we can assume that was Mayor Bradley's first political move? <laughs> yeah, he was president of the university club, the black students at UCLA at that time. See, this is the fifth show, and every time I learn more and more. Okay, fantastic. And, and so you also went off to be the first African-American officer who, who was also at UCLA, and yeah, tell us a little it's about not that. because I was the best qualified. UCLA was a branch of Berkeley. Berkeley was a land-grant college. Every male student had to take ROTC. But if you were colored, you couldn't become an officer. The reason? There was no segregated ROTC camp for you to go to. 
On the East Coast, they had one because Howard and some of the other black universities had ROTC. They had a separate camp for them to go to. I broke through for two reasons. First, I had been a cadet captain at Manual Arts High School, junior ROTC. So under the rules, I could apply four times. Every black before me, or with me, including Tom Bradley, could only apply once. They turned me down all four times. All the white officers were included the first time. They turned me down all four times. Then the other factor kicked in. A war's about to start. There's going to be a place to put colored lieutenants. I slipped through. <laughs> but I didn't become a Tuskegee Airman. Just that's my buddy. So over there's, here we have Roger, Roger B. Duncan became a Tuskegee. Tell us a little bit about that. And also an ex-firefighter as well. Yeah. And, and let me just take the time to introduce Harold Arnold as well. Okay, so we have all three now. Mr. Arnett Hartsfield, Harold Arnold, and Roger Duncan. Roger has the advantage of both of us. His pension is tax free. <laughs> <laughs> now that's not fair. That's not fair. I had back surgery, had four discs removed from my back, and with that I had to seek different employment. So I left in 1947 and applied for a job at Douglas Aircraft Company. <laughs> uh, they were very gracious to me. They spoke about how beautiful my application was and, and I thanked them very much and as I walked out the door I saw the lady slip it in the wastebasket. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's, let's uh, explain for our viewers a little more about the isolation, which is really under the skies of integration. Well, let me give you my story, because it really kept it. <clears throat> when the fire department found out I was the first black on the 40 list, they called me down to headquarters. Hartsfield, we're not going to appoint you. You're overqualified. That's the little game they used to play with us. You're always either underqualified or overqualified. At that time, I was only a sophomore at UCLA. Didn't have a degree. Eight years later, they told me, rookie, you're being integrated. I thought back to 1940. I said, wait a minute. I was overqualified when I was a sophomore. <clears throat> now I've got two degrees. <laughs> I've graduated from law school and passed the bar the first time. I have served my country for three years as an officer. I've been awarded a Bronze Star Medal. They'll be so glad to have me. <laughs> I got to engine 45 and the captain says, Archville, I'm asking you not to come in the kitchen when the white firemen are eating. I swole up like a bullfrog. <clears throat> I don't have to take this. I'm an attorney. I'll quit. That night, the dear Lord whispered in my ear, says, you dumb rookie, you've put 15 years in that pension system. If you quit, you don't even get your own money back. I swallowed my pride. I ate alone for four and a half years, but I had the whole kitchen to myself. <laughs> I think I've gotten even with them. I've now been drawing pension 46 and a half years and counting. And starting January the 1st of 2005, my pension is now more than 10 times as many dollars as I used to fight fire for. Every one of my men went through a similar experience. Let Roger tell you the first day that he was, quote, isolated. Okay, Roger. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> I was transferred to Engine 81, and I went there just like, you know, with all my equipment, and we had a line up, and I was on the right end of the line, and the acting captain came out and put my, his hand between me and the man to my left, and said, all right, teach, hut, left up, hold it, and it up to, up to, up to, and left me standing there alone letting me get the idea of what I had come into. Then they said, Duncan, you stand there. And they took my personal record book and went into 
the captain's room with it and spoke in a loud voice so that I could hear them. I said, oh, look here, fellas, we got a smart nigger here. This nigger's got a degree in mathematics, in mathematics and physics. Yeah. And this, why, he, he, has, he has worked on airplanes. He is different. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll take care of him. In time, he'll be down, cut him down to size. And that's the way I met the first day of my work. And tell them what you said to yourself. <laughs> I said, they might do everything in the world, but they'll never, ever run me off of this job. You can uh, also talk with um, Harold Arnold, give you an opportunity as well. Uh, you're not 89, are you? In his 80s. Uh, May the 2nd, 84. I thought he was around 55 or something. Here we go. <laughs> Give, give us your take on this also. Let's start also with you. This, this is where you began as well? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, Let's start with where you began in the fire department. I was born uh, at 1141 East 33rd Street right off of Central Avenue. And I walked to the fire station around the corner my first day at work. <laughs> Changed clothes, stayed 24 hours, come back, <laughs> do the same thing the next day. <laughs> but I, I wasn't one of the, you know, most every interview I've ever had, uh, and I'm so glad I, I bl got blown away at the police when I took the police. Uh, why do you want to be a police? Well, I'm not going to tell this lie about I always wanted to help the people. That's a bunch of junk. You go for the salary. <laughs> when, I, when I came out of the Army, I needed a J-O-B. Sheriffs, firemen, Department of Water and Power, police. I took the fire department, and I didn't make a mistake. It was... It, how, as Jackie Gleason said, how sweet it is. In spite of that, one of the men at 45 as a rookie came, came up to me and said, uh, you folks just aren't ready. I had the privilege of telling him, we're just asking you to accept the ones that are ready. <laughs> and then later he told me, we don't want this job to become like the post office, a colored man's job. I said, well, what are you doing here? You could have been president. Right. I'm here because this is the best I can do. Finally, he tried me one more time. <clears throat> Hearts failed. You got all the advantages. You got the NAACP, the Urban League, the Supreme Court. I said, wait a minute, Bill. Tomorrow morning when we get off duty, come with me down to headquarters and tell them you've got a drop of black blood in you. And you won't even have to prove it. And you'll have all of my advantages. <laughs> the next morning, I couldn't find Bill. I don't know what happened to him. We're going to have a Jan Perry council, councilwoman Jan. Woman Jan Perry of the nice Green district, House. whose name is on this building, who changed her schedule yeah. to be here because she loved you so much. So let's see what she has to say. Well, I really, I'm really thrilled to be here and just hear your words and and I thought it was significant enough that I actually brought my 16 year old daughter to listen to because I think it's important for her to hear these things and, and I don't know you other gentlemen as well as I know Arnett but I have to say for me he's like the griot of the fire department he tells a story and he tells a story the generations that have come after him and hopefully we will continue to tell the story the generations that come after us but what's most touching about him is the way he shared his private collection and I know many of the firefighters have shared their memorabilia and pictures and and artifacts and things that you know you gathered over the years but to look just behind you just behind you the the multitude of stories that are there just as a backdrop it is living history and told through your words and through your deeds and your activism too you know you had to do more than just be a firefighter you know you're symbol to the community a symbol of hope a symbol of dignity and intelligence and public service and a willingness to serve no matter what no matter when and I don't think I can even imagine what that must have been like and what you all went through and to be able to sit here and look at the three of you now 
and, and to see you speak about it without a trace of bitterness and with an enormous amount of pride, you speaking about your, your child and your grandchild and, you know, Arnett, I mean, how many times have we been able to look at the pictures? So, I, I know, I feel pretty blessed that we have the three of you here today and um, I'm just glad that they're putting this on film so we can share it with anybody who comes to the doors now and in the future. So I just want to say a public thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to share a bit of your lives with us. Now, before we go, I just want to thank Jan Perry. Like she, she adjusted her whole schedule just to be here, to be here Special guy. change her whole schedule and everything. We just want to thank her for the great work thank she's you. done over her two terms. I think you probably have the most diverse district. In yeah. Most first, yeah, well, I do. Okay. And she held her inauguration dinner right in the parking lot it was nice. of this station. Is that right? Yeah, we had yes. 700 people. We had 700 people in a tent in the parking lot. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Because you know, you know, I, her her area is so diverse. I mean, you have like downtown people, then you have up there in Bunker Hill area, or uh -huh. just below that in the business district, and all the factories and right. a lot of Hispanic yeah. areas and black areas. And I just want to say that you've done such a commendable job. Uh -huh. You know, because uh -huh. because. You can please some of the people some of the time. You just can't please all the people all the time. You've had to take a lot. But, yeah. you know, you're a strong, brave woman. Yeah. I read your bio. It's yeah. in your blood. Your yeah. family were council people. Your mother was a council person. See, I read everything on you. Uh -oh. They were also mayors. So it's in your blood, and you handled it very well, and we are very proud of you. Thank I you. live in this district, and I appreciate you. Thank you. I'm glad, and I'm glad you did this. Okay. On this day, the firemen are here with our next, the rookie Hartsfield, as you heard them ride by. We are gathered here to say happy birthday on your 89th birthday and celebrate a man who trailblazed through the decades to make a better place and a better life for many in the Los Angeles and the country and this great world. May God continue to bless Arnett, the rookie Hartsfield, and may God continue to bless this, the great city of Los Angeles, and may all our firefighters continue to be protected by those that have come before. All right. Um, again, this is Blair from Unified Fathers for Life doing a special segment on, I guess we're really doing a segment on the history of black firefighters, and we also are honoring Mr. Arnett Hartsfield on his 89th birthday. Just for the record, just for reference, for those of you that don't quite understand, that's 32,385 days of sunups and sundowns. Okay, and here we have a, a late entry, uh, Mr. <laughs> Councilman, um, Chief Councilman, as I've heard uh, 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 you referred to before, uh, Chief Councilman Bernard Parks of the 8th District, I believe it is now. Uh, many, many years ago, I, I looked at your bio, it doesn't say much about the harbor. But many years ago, he was running a harbor, which is really a major accomplishment. That's like being the CEO of a major corporation. Then went on to distinguish himself uh, by reducing violence in Los Angeles as the chief of police. Um, he reduced violence. He challenged corruption. He stood for that which is right in a police officer, I think. And um, now, as a councilman, it's kind of like kickback. You've done all these major things, and 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 no matter. What but no matter what, you are truly, in my opinion, just like these gentlemen, a true and genuine role model, and we are honored to have you here. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate being here, and uh, this is a, a definite role model. Uh, I came on the police department in uh, 1965, well after he was being, you know, dealing with a number of issues. In fact, uh, in 65 was uh, a couple of years after they started integrating patrol cars. In 61, that started. Uh, and we all remember Tom Bradley left the department in 61 because they told him he couldn't be a captain of police. Uh, so he then became a lawyer. He then became a city councilman for 10 years, became a mayor for 20 years. So he could probably have been a captain, right? Can we all agree on that? But, uh, when Tom was running against Sam Yardy, his slogan was eight years is enough. 
And he got into state 20. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if you remember his first campaign, oh, yeah. uh, law enforcement in, in great numbers came out and basically said, if he's elected, we'll retire. <laughs> and didn't go anywhere. But that, that was... I stood on City Hall, mm -hmm. West Steps, and watched the police department go by and salute town. Yeah. What a wonderful thing yeah. that was. But I think what we find is that in Exhibit 65, when I came on, it was interesting, the transition, they were just beginning to integrate. And I remember in high school, the first time I ever saw a black police officer and a white police officer in the same car was um, in 61 at the corner of Adams and Western. Mm. And it was such a remarkable thing that I actually went home and told my parents. And <laughs> they were trying to figure out why I thought that was uh, so important. And I said, I've never seen in the city of Los Angeles a black and white officer in the same car having met Homer Broom and, and uh, Joe Rosan and uh, Ed Henry and people like that and Jess Brewer, they advised me that in the 50s, in early 60s, if you were black and a police officer, if your partner didn't come to work who was a black partner, you, didn't have, you couldn't go to work or you worked a footbeat or you worked a car by yourself or they sent you home. I always like your story which you told us years ago about how you came on the fire department uh, with a law degree and what you thought that was going to mean, and they told you quickly what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, here you are a firefighter with a law degree, and they said, Still you can't, ready. you cannot eat in this room, and you can't sleep no, in that no, room. You can't even come in the room. Couldn't come in the, the room. right fire eating. Yeah. yeah. So, and I, and I think, you know, one thing that was just, when I saw you in, in city council recently, uh, on this whole issue of the, the, the Tinney case, you made a very profound statement. You said, you know, this is what we thought was going on for years. We just didn't know how to prove it. Yeah. And that was a, a somewhat of an eye opener. I just want to say happy birthday. I'm glad he had a chance to come by and see you. You will always. Uh, he turned 89, 89 in January. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> nice. That's it. That's right. I'm glad to see you. you. He just reminded me that he knew me when I was like that. Thirty-thirty. Eleven forty-seven each. Thirty-thirty. My sister, Cleo. Yeah. Firefighter saved her life, and then my father gave her tons of skin. They had the first mm -hmm. generation of skin graphing, yeah. yeah. and so. He donated. Yes, it, it saved her life because she she was uh, all excited about. Uh, her birthday and she got up early and you know those little white heaters with the the holes in them she put her gown over the top of it and went up in flames and they uh for months general hospital saved her life they did not think that she was going to live we're not going to put that on <laughs> <laughs> okay, but take care of yourself. All right. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you. Well, thank you. Become a CEO of something that I never saw passing. I see him at the Fed Market. I'm gonna wrap up. Yeah. Okay, so this is Blaze from Unified Fathers for Life, and we just like to thank everyone for coming to participate in this uh, council, people. Of course, I want to thank uh, Captain Brent Burton. Um, I, I think uh, Mr. Harshfield and myself were sitting in this room, what, about eight or nine days ago, yeah. planning the shoot. And then we said, well, let's invite some more people, because I found it was his birthday. Mm -hmm. So this has been a very unexpected and special day for what I consider to be living American history, not just living black history, but living, I don't know how they separate blacks from American history, but this is definitely a, a, a man of living American history and his friends are, I believe, just as distinguished and it's just as important to me that we keep bringing these links, these links to what, the 19th century, 20th century, and the 21st century. So uh, I'm very happy to have been here on your 89th birthday, which was June 14th, even though today is the 18th. Just last, did you work on your birthday? Tomorrow's going to be June what? 
June 19th. Juneteenth. Huh? Juneteenth. Juneteenth. Oh, that's right. I, I went to an event in Lamera Park last year and I didn't know. They kept saying it. I said, what? I did the same thing. I was like, huh? Watermelon Day, baby. Huh? Tell us a little bit about what that day means. Well, that's the day they freed y'all and... Uh, you know, my, <laughs> Y'all, yeah. Yeah, the, my, my, my parents were in Arkansas, and uh, they didn't have television, quick communication, to, uh, high definition then. <laughs> so it had to go by a horse, and they didn't know it was, it was free until the 19th of June. <laughs> oh, I didn't, now I remember. You, right. now I remember. Now I remember. you know, when you get 80-something, you go to sleep early, huh? So, so, so we, right, we've really gone longer than I want to go. So let me just say, so first of all, we'd like to thank Mr. Roger B. Duncan yes, for participating, and Mr. Harold Arnold for participating, and of course, the one and only Mr. Arnett Hartsfield, who has self-proclaimed himself now as the eternal saint. The eternal rookie. The eternal rookie. And uh, thanks to the town crier for giving us that cry and the council people and everyone who participated, Leroy Cooper and everyone else, we thank you.